Folklore, tall tales, myths, monsters, they've influenced cinema since the cinematograph. However, ancient lore about monsters don't just terrorize, they moralize, giving meaning, structure, and common language to a society. But as films take on these old stories, they often update the original message to suit their needs. So let's take a look around the world at cinema's deadliest folktales and what they're trying to tell us about ourselves. Folktales come in as many shapes and sizes as the films that adapt them. Sometimes it's a direct retelling, while others pick and choose their inspiration. Take Candyman, for example. The film addresses racism and socioeconomic inequalities here in the US by pulling together a complex origin story based on an amalgamation of Clive Barker's short story about classism in Liverpool, the urban legend of the Hookman, and the legend of Bloody Mary, which some say is based on another folktale about a Chicago area slave catcher in the 19th century, Mary Worth. But whatever the source, there's always a function to folktales. These functions can be varied and nuanced, as with Candyman, an exploration of representation and who gets mythologized as monsters, while other folktales have simpler morals about religion, sex, or, as with our first stop, the danger of flying too close to the sun. A good old-fashioned cautionary tale. When looking at cautionary tales, there's really no better place to start than the original, and its warnings of man playing God. A silent classic from German Expressionism, The Gollum, How He Came Into the World, heavy with impending doom, looming doorways, and 1920s eyeliner, is based on a 1914 novel by Gustav Meyrink, which was in turn loosely based on 19th century folk stories about a 16th century rabbi in Prague who created a golem to defend the ghetto from anti-Semitic attacks. The Gollum in the film, played by director Paul Wegner, is a hulking clay man with a square head of hair in the style of a terracotta warrior or a pharaoh. It first helps its creator, Rabbi Lowe, with chores before convincing the emperor to reverse his decision to expel the Jews from the city. Sadly, the Gollum's dark magic makes it go berserk, turning on the very ghetto it was supposed to protect. The enduring trope of a man-made creature who first helps with laborious drudgery before gaining sentience and wreaking havoc upon its creators has made us ever more anxious from the Gollum's contemporaries like Frankenstein all the way to more modern tales of artificial intelligence like Ex Machina. But not all of man's creations have turned into AI. From Estonia, November is the traditional story of the Krat, a creature made of hay and household tools. The tale involves an unlucky farmer compelled to build a crat to perform chores and bring him treasure. To give his crat life, he signs his soul away to the devil with three drops of blood, infusing the creature with a human soul. The only escape from the debt is to trick the crat by giving it an impossible to complete task. Ultimately, the creature becomes the man's downfall. However, the poverty-stricken peasants in November are much cleverer than the original farmer. They cheat the devil out of his soul by giving him three currents instead of three drops of blood and make the crat implode by asking for a ladder made out of a loaf of bread. The Krat is just one part of this poetic film full of folkloric characters, such as a personified plague, a common figure in Eastern European legends where the pandemic lasted longer than in the West, a witch, a werewolf, and chalky white ghosts that visit their relative sauna on All Souls Day. But like the Gollum's influence in cinema's treatment of modern AI, Estonia, now one of the most digitally advanced governments in the world, has named their AI strategy the Krat Law because they understand that artificial intelligence can be a powerful tool, but only if they're developed with caution and strategy. I'm not dead. If there's a common thread in the man-made creature mythology, it might be man's desire to elevate himself by creating life. It's a lie. Along those lines, on the more base end of those lines, is a different kind of desire. Folktales often use dangerous creatures, ghosts, and specters to explore our relationship to love and sex. Going back to the 60s, you can see traditional folktales about love and sex getting retrofitted to their times. From Japan, we get the mini ghosts of Kwaidan, addressing relationship issues like treating wives with respect, keeping your word, and the high price of being careless set against fantastic sets of psychedelic painted backdrops, windy forests, and colored filters, making this film a beautiful spectacle of 1960s style overlaid on Japanese folklore. Then the 70s saw a proliferation of erotic vampire tales, and the 80s produced a pack of werewolf movies as metaphors for adolescence and sex like The Howling and even Teen Wolf. 
And for overt sexuality, we're staying in the 80s, sort of. 2015's The Lure from Poland puts Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid in the seedy nightclub scene of 1980s Warsaw. With synth-heavy musical numbers and excessive nudity, the two mermaid siren sisters, Golden and Silver, sport tails that are not sparkly but monstrous and smelly. Their sharp teeth can tear into a man's throat. Golden and Silver go shopping, take up smoking, they strip, they experiment sexually, and communicate with dolphin-like squeaks. Silver falls dangerously in love with the bassist at their nightclub, a beautiful boy who says he only thinks of her as a fish but flirts with her anyway, and you can see the trappings of the original fairy tale, but it's messier and more glam rock than any version of The Little Mermaid. Director Agnieszka Smozenska likened the mermaids to immigrants who become sex workers on their way to bigger dreams. She uses the backdrop of Hans Christian Andersen's tale to both up in the male gaze and humanize these vengeful fish out of water. As explicitly sexual as the lure is, the other side of the folktale coin deals with repression. Clashes between genders provide folktales and the films adapting them fertile ground to explore those dynamics. For this, we have to consider what some critics claim is the first true folk horror movie, 1952's White Reindeer from Finland. Shot in the Arctic, the film makes great use of snow-laden cabins and reindeer graves to depict an increasingly forlorn story set in Lapland. A spirited Sami woman, Pirita, marries Aslak, a reindeer herder, but soon gets lonely waiting for him to come home. Pirita visits a shaman for a love potion so that her husband won't want to leave her. As he makes the potion and beats on his drum, the shaman realizes that Perita is a witch. Her mysterious heritage superpowers the potion and transforms her into a shape-shifting white reindeer, a rarity thought to be magical reindeer royalty that brings luck, riches, and happiness. When men try to lasso her, she turns back into a woman and sinks her fangs into her captors. At first glance, it seems like a warning about dangerous, wild women and their desires, but the film instead takes a sympathetic view towards Perita, who finds herself in this terrible state only because of love. It also subtly comments on the disappearing pagan Sami culture due to encroaching Christian values from the South, which brings up another excellent function of deadly folktales on screen, the old versus the new. The intersection of ancient folklore and modern beliefs is a conflicted place, and in cinematic updates of the old tales, it's usually the female characters bearing the brunt of the carnage. A recent slew of Southeast Asian films explore the conflict between organized religion and older shamanism. Malaysia's jungle horror film Ro is inspired by Hantu Pimburu, a spectral huntsman, and the Iblis from the Quran. While Thailand's Inhuman Kiss utilizes the nocturnal spirit Krasu to examine both gender roles and the opposing forces of spiritual and modern beliefs. The Krasu is a well-known creature throughout Southeast Asia. It's a beautiful young woman's head that dislodges from her body at night, trailing the heart and intestines with it. In Thai folklore, the Krasu has been cursed to drink blood or eat the flesh of chickens, water buffalo, carrion, or even excrement. People are admonished not to leave their clean laundry hanging out at night because the Krasu might wipe its mouth on it. Krasu are created either from witchcraft, the sin of abortion, or the consumption of food contaminated by a Krasu's saliva. It's basically an all-encompassing warning to stay home at night, hurry up with the chores, and not sleep around. Inhuman Kiss starts off as a Twilight-esque teen love triangle in a small village in the 1940s. Sai is a sweet girl working as a nurse. Jurd is a rambunctious childhood friend crushing on her, but Sai misses Noi, the gentler boy from their youth who's studying medicine in Bangkok. He comes home after the city is bombed, but he's accompanied by a gang of Krasu hunters who suspect one is haunting the village. When a skeptical Noi is in the swamp researching methane gases that might make people hallucinate the Krasu, he witnesses Sai's head flying home to her body. This dreadful secret unites them, making this a romance between a boy and his floating demon head girlfriend. Of guts. A helpful monk encourages Noi to trust his gut instead of following everyone else's condemnation of Krasu. The movie shifts gears from long, wistful gazes to a bonkers confrontation between angry mobs, Krasu hunters, and muscle-bound demons. Meanwhile, 2016's Under the Shadow, set in 1980s Tehran, continues the thread of religion and its demands on women. 
This film lives in domestic creepiness and the tension inherent in a conservative religious state that was previously liberal and modern. A woman named Sheeta is coming to terms with not being able to finish medical school because she was politically active during the Iranian Revolution. Now she must stay at home with her daughter Dorsa, while her husband gets drafted to the front lines of the war with Iraq. A missile lands on their apartment without exploding, but an evil jinn has come with it. While the term jinn is used to describe any number of supernatural creatures across mythologies, this one is not the benevolent variety. It tries to steal their most prized possessions with hopes of possessing the characters themselves. It creepily impersonates friends and family members, climbing under bed covers, whipping around fabric, and afflicting poor Dorsa with the fever she can't break. Dorsa tells Sheeta they can't leave until they find her doll, otherwise she'll never get better. This puts mounting pressure on her mother, who is trying not to lose her mind while she hunts for the doll, swatting away her husband's critical phone calls, the decency police who want to flog her for running out into the night without her hijab, and the terrifying visions in the increasingly claustrophobic apartment. The relationship between mother and daughter keeps getting more argumentative as the jinn grinds them down, and Shide contends with her own feelings of inadequacy. And so, Under the Shadow is able to adapt a mythological figure to illustrate just how terrifying Shide's situation really was. There's a reason folktales are universal, spanning centuries and cultures across the globe. They speak to the core of human existence with an adaptability that has allowed filmmakers from all walks of life to make sharp social commentary wrapped up in terrifying stories that transcend local legend. So, what's your favorite folktale to hit the big screen? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more trips around the world of cinema.